Hey everybody, this is Human Factors Cast, episode 32. We are looking at March 7th. I can't believe how much time has already gone by. We got a great show for you today. Uh, NASA released a bunch of free software. The Nintendo sh- uh, I should almost call it the Nintendo shit, but it's already getting a bunch of DIY fixed treatments. And there's a ton of human-robot interaction news this week. Human Factors Cast starts right now. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. <laughs> Nintendo shit. I, I, I didn't even. I just came up with that right now. <laughs> Welcome back. Nick Rome coming in hot, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> with the giggles to oh. start your Tuesday off. <laughs> oh my gosh. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Blake Arnsdorf. Howdy, everybody. How are you doing on this wonderful Tuesday evening, afternoon? Depends on where you are. I know. It How are you, Nick? I'm good. I'm good. And also, we can't forget our third uh, host here is uh, Alexa. Tell us about yourself. I'm an Amazon Echo designed around your voice. I can provide information, music. Alexa, stop. Weather- yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have Alexa on the show today. Uh, she's probably going to be jumping in from time to time, um, telling us about some stuff. I don't know. Well, we got some Amazon stories. Blake, anyway, how are you, buddy? It's been a week. And I am doing good, and it's wonderful to be joined by such a very nice-sounding robot. Okay. We got a lot of robot news yeah. this week, too, so it's perfect. It's time for that singularity to happen, I think. Um, Certainly, man. What you been up to? I've heard uh, heard some rumblings of a film that you saw over the weekend. Yeah, I saw Get Out, uh, and it was phenomenal. If any of our listeners on the fence or are, are, are on the fence about going to see Get Out, get out of your house and go see it. it uh, oh, I know. You heard it, it first it. here. Jeez. Uh, it was a fantastic movie. Um, don't read into it too much. Like the premise I was not at all was I, what I was expecting it to be. But go go check it out. It's it's a uh, it's definitely a wonderful piece of film. And I'm not even that big of a horror fan. Uh, my partner is and and. She she really enjoyed it, but I enjoyed it just as well without being a horror fan. That's awesome, and I can't believe it was directed by Jordan Peele. I think, yeah, right? Jordan Peele, yeah, the guy, same guy on Key and Peele. Uh, yep, epic. Blake, how are you? You doing okay over there? Man, I am good. Believe it or not, I found myself wading through a bunch of Pokemon cards earlier because I'm looking to sell a bunch of them on eBay. Oh man, how much are those going for now? Uh, some of the, believe it or not, some of them were upwards of like $200 just a piece. And, and you know what, you know what really irritates me about that is I, I sold all of mine at a garage sale right before I moved, um, uh, to Idaho for grad school. And if I sold them individually, I probably would have got a lot more money for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'll be, it's, uh, it's been tricky, but yeah, I'm doing the same thing. I mean, while I was moving, getting ready to sell stuff, but yeah, that's pretty much it. This, uh. This to the start of this week, enjoying this fine rainy weather out here in Atlanta. Oh man! Well, we got a lot of news to get to, but uh, just another quick note: uh, we are still keeping the show at Tuesday for the time being. We moved it to accommodate Billy, but we have no idea where he is. We hope he's okay if he's listening. Um, we haven't been able to get a hold of him, so if you want to reach out to Comstar Cleric on Twitter or anything, let him know that we miss him on the show and that he's uh, he's missed by you guys. So. Anyway, this is let's get into the human factors news. This is the show. This is part of the show, all about human factors news. Now, this could be anything from virtual reality uh, to automation, psychology, design, anything that has to do with the field of human factors. Blake, you're reading the news stories. What's up first? You know it. All right. So NASA has published its 2017-2018 software catalog, which lists the many apps, code libraries, and tools that pretty much anyone can download and use. Most of it's pretty closely tied to the launching of spacecraft and stuff like that, of course. But there are a few items that might prove useful to tinkerers and curious lay people alike. Now, Nick, I did not know that this was something that NASA does, because obviously this is a yearly or annual thing because it's a software catalog. But what did you think about some of these apps and different code libraries they released? You know, I haven't had a chance to poke around through any of these, but I I mean, NASA is uh, pretty good about releasing their stuff. I mean, it's where we're us in the field, human factors people, we got the NASA TLX, which is a great uh, sort of workload indication tool slash uh, metrics. So they're pretty open source about all their stuff. Um, 
like I said, I haven't got a chance to check out some of these things, but some of the things on my list for sure are, um, like, they have a spacewalk game, which you can um, simulate various extravehicular activities on the ISS, right? Uh, they also have a repository of a lot of 3D models that you can play with, and then there's a couple images and textures that you could use for educational or pur personal purposes. So I can see a lot of lot of cool stuff coming out of this. How about you? Did you take a deep dive into this at all yet? So the one thing I took a hard look at and dove into a little on their website was some of the weather models that they have opened for people to use. And with like the myriad of satellites that NASA has, NASA has their disposal, like they've got to have one of the best like abilities to just create more realistic models that are predictive in terms of weather. And actually remind me of working back at Pacific Science, like how valuable some of this information or the model generation algorithms would be to people out in the field. Um, it made me want to look at the specific iOS companion app for their weather models that they mentioned because, I mean, if they're if this algorithm is any good, like getting some connection between what's being done at NASA and being done in the field by the military would be pretty awesome. Right, right. Um, but I was pretty I was pretty stoked that they do so much open source stuff for because I mean that that on its own has led developers to create more innovative web apps and software in just the space in general. So. I can't only imagine they'll seek, seek to reap the benefits out of it. And I remember you talking about the TLX. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. You know, along with like the other cognitive enhancement tool or cognitive measurement tools they have. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff that's coming out of NASA. Uh, but if you guys, our listeners, are interested in a piece of software, you can head on over to our Facebook page where we post the show notes. You can follow a link in those show notes to this repository. Um like I said, there's a ton of stuff. We just scratched the surface with this stuff, but go go deep dive in it. I'm sure someone is going to find something really cool in there. All right, Blake. Yeah, check it out and leave us a comment <laughs> on the Facebook page. We'd love to see what you guys are checking out. Yeah, what you found. All right, Blake, what's up next? All right, so I don't know how many people were affected by this, but I certainly was. Everyone. So a little after 1 p.m. last Tuesday, countless websites and web services ground to a halt following a reported widespread outage of Amazon Web Services, also known as AWS. The widespread out outage was caused by a failure at AWS's Northern Virginia facility. Everything from Slack to Co to Cahora was, or sorry, saw major disruptions. Even Down Detector ironically went down. <laughs> Man, it was kind of amazing how many things were driven down by just this one, what's supposedly an older hub of information for Amazon Web Services went down, I mean, affecting such big players like Slack. I mean, that's nuts. Right. And I think I think this was due to, oh, was this the one that was just one letter of code or was that last week? That was last week, right? That, yeah, it was last week. I mean, this, this is probably something similar, but I mean, uh, d do we know if Pornhub went down? <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, it was left alone. Oh, man. All right. Well, I, you know what's funny is that those websites track metrics of uh, visitors. And so I wonder if, you know, that you saw a surge when there was nothing else to do on the internet. No, this is, um, mm, this highlights a fatal flaw in our, um, internet architecture. I, I think anyway, like, cause I think we have a lot of opportunity to, there, there's a lot of opportunity for, uh, for, for malicious activity here. You know, who, who knows if this was a hack or if this was, um, if there was malicious intent behind this, but it's scary to me to think that over the past couple of weeks, there have been these, um, I don't know, like human error or just, I can't even describe it. It's like, what's well, it's, going it's on? strange. Cause it's been two <laughs> very small things. And I guess it within two weeks, right? I mean, right. cloud bleed was like, we just talked about it. It was literally the mistake of one lot, one like character in a line of code causing like major information just to be spilt out. So that's like a big architecture flaw, right? And now we're talking about somebody as big as Amazon Web Services, which I can't even imagine. I mean, we've got Slack on here for sure and some other right. ones, but there's millions of heavy hitters, I'm sure, and even small businesses too that are using Amazon Web Services. And for like an old or one of their older facilities to be the one that was like the, the break in the chain was pretty intense and it seemed like from the reports from amazon that it, it was something rather simple like it was just a problem with how the um excuse me the data was being written and just being written to the wrong area yeah um, 
I mean, just something so simple can can lead to something this big. And so, if I don't know, I'm I'm about that cybersecurity stuff. Like, let's let's buckle down. <laughs> it's scary to me. Yeah, it's scary. Most to me. definitely. I mean, it was good that Amazon reacted the way it did, like keeping it very calm and giving people continuous progress updates. But I don't know the way that they're hiding it. It seems like the cy- cybersecurity needs to be worked on at their uh, in their home headquarters. Yeah, hang on. You know what? I I do have a question for uh, Alexa. Alexa, were you down uh, last Tuesday at one p.m.? Sorry. I cannot answer questions for events in the past. Ah, yeah. Well, she's being cheeky about it. So, all right, Blake, let's go ahead. And... <laughs> What's up next? All right. So on Friday, Yelp announced that it will now allow users to find out if businesses have a gender neutral bathroom. Yelp's definition of a gender neutral bathroom is a single stall bathroom accessible by any gender. That will soon be sourced from both business owners and users. Uh, political, political opinions aside, this is, this isn't good news. This is good news. Uh, and I especially appreciate the way they handled the definition of a gender neutral bathroom. They're basically saying, you know, if there's a bathroom that you can sort of go in that doesn't have any other stalls, it's one single stall, uh, that's accessible by any gender, then put it in. So, and, and I mean talk about user experience like they're trying to reach out to everybody and and i i'm a big data person right i I love data and i love analyzing data and just looking at that data and for me this is just one more data point that is going to inform us for a lot of things to come i guess (laughs) yeah it's it to me it was kind of it was i don't know i thought it was kind of funny with me it's like basically just rip off the sign that says like i don't know if you've seen these before where it's like a dual bathroom where it says man or woman can use it or like they include like a family bathroom i mean just like basically take that sign down and say gender neutral right well yeah i think that's that's what they're trying to identify here is is any of those types of bathrooms it's pretty cool and it's uh it is a big deal like regardless of where you fall politically it's a big deal that a company like yelp is taking this on um, they, I mean, they obviously see it as an issue that they want to be on, uh, like a positive side of. So it's really cool. I, I like seeing bigger companies like this take on big political issues. Right, right. Uh, okay, Blake, what's up next? All right. So Walmart's back up in our news story. So Walmart has upgraded their app this week to introduce express lane services for both prescription pickups and money transfers. The idea here is that once you've filled in a medicine or money transfer order on your phone, you just have to walk up to the appropriate store counter, scan a QR code with the app, and complete your business transaction. So this feature will start rolling out to stores in March, and deployment will finish sometime in the fall. So Nick, this sounds like a great idea on Walmart's part, and I I really think they're super ahead of the curve on a lot of other stores, and this is going to be like a trend-setting event. but the one thing I did not know was that people are still actively using QR codes. I honestly don't know when the last time I had seen a QR code being used was. Yeah, well, I mean, you can... So the way I see this is there's a Walmart app. And most apps now have a QR code reader built in. So like they'll just use the Walmart app and say, scan the thing. Uh, but I mean, this this could be a really big time saver for like prescriptions or whatever. This is kind of akin to what Amazon's trying to do with their uh, brick and mortar stores, where you walk in and walk out with the thing, and it charges your account automatically just for what you pick up in the store. Um, Which is super awesome because it knew I went into an Amazon store in La Jolla and out and didn't know that it was going to take into account just by swiping my credit card that I was a Prime member and I saved like the exact amount of money I would save online. Oh yeah, they're uh, they're uh, they're trialing they're trialing uh, or they're running a trial where people can just walk in and I don't know how they're doing it. Uh, magic of the internet, but you walk in, grab your stuff, walk out, and it charges you like without even going up to a register. Oh, now that's something I had, I didn't experience. That's pretty cool. And yeah. I, I feel like Walmart could benefit from a similar model, right? Like I as so far too. as maybe if they, I'm not sure like how all other stuff works, but if they're like, if somebody's using their app, like allowing them to make purchases or anything that's related to like online prices versus what might be in store, if it's better, that kind of stuff. Right, right. Uh, while we're on the topic, Alexa, Alexa, what do you think of Walmart? 
<laughs> I don't have an opinion on that. Yeah, well, she's a boring. All right, what's up next? I'm kind of surprised. All right. So anyway, our big favorite, Google is making more news. So Google is making a significant change to how its App Store Google Play will work in terms of making the best games more easily discover, discoverable by end users. At the Game Developers Conference, the company announced that it, cert, that it recently tuned its App Store algorithms to take into account user engagement and not just downloads and other in order to better reward quality titles as opposed to those that are be that are being installed in large numbers. So Nick, I thought this was great because this tags on to what we had talked about earlier, or I guess a couple weeks ago about yeah. Google making updates to the Google play store. But I like the idea that they're really looking at user engagement and not just straight up downloads. Right. Yeah, no, this is, this is just a smart move. They're really cleaning up the app store, you know, uh, they, they, uh, what was it? A couple weeks ago, they were they were doing um, they were just getting rid of all their crapware, basically. And I I forget what the criteria for that was. Um, do you remember? Uh, I know that what they were doing was one. They were looking at if the developer had deployed specific privacy and user uh, yes uh, data. I think like contracts within like their agreements, and also they were looking for zombie apps, like right. apps just kind of run in the background or not or not any good. That's right. Yeah, no, this is this I love this because it's a user metric that they are using to inform other users on whether or not they would like this app or whether or not users enjoy using this app. And so it's just going to perpetuate a better app store experience for people. I, I think it's great. Yeah, yeah. I I would like to know what they take into account or what the algorithm's looking at when it talks about user engagement because knowing google it's probably some more than just like a few criteria there's probably like a whole readout about what that is and maybe i'll have to look into that but yeah. again great that they're getting away from just the downloads i mean just on the surface i would imagine times opened per day per week uh per month uh also there's so actually google play has uh its own achievement system and so i would imagine that that's a metric that they use to whoever downloads this how many achievements do they get uh i would also imagine that in-app purchases they already track that uh for top grossing apps i i think that all these together kind of makes that just on the surface and i know they can probably grab more metrics out of it so it'd be interesting to see what apps come up to the top after they implement this yeah, seriously. I mean, I can't wait to see because I like the Google Play Store and the way that it's the way that it's moving. Yeah, I know. I uh, I alone can probably attest to uh, Galaxy of Heroes making the top uh, as a Star Wars game. It's probably going to make the top because <laughs> I am engaged every day. All right, Blake, what's, <laughs> what's up next? All right, so this was near and dear to my Xbox loving heart. So Microsoft is launching a new service called Xbox Games pa Game Pass. It's a library of more than 100 games that you can download and play for a monthly subscription of $9.99. Some games will be available in the subscription for a limited time and eventually are replaced with other games. The feature ha isn't live yet, but Microsoft says we can expect, or expect it later this spring. Now, I was super excited about this because there was a lot of games that were included with the monthly subscription that is only nine ninety nine. I mean, that's about what as much as Netflix or Hulu. Yeah, that's exactly. Um, it's Netflix for games, basically. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's it's exactly what this is. But what was awesome is that they're gonna throw in a lot of the backwards compatible Xbox three hundred and sixty games too, like some of the older Gears of War and Halo and things like that. So you don't have to actually purchase them or like still have the 360 games so right I it's mean, pretty pretty sweet deal by microsoft why wouldn't you like it, it's just a uh, why not get people to pay for old games that they missed out on or old games that are not making money anymore for that that subscription price i mean we're an on-demand culture now and it fits that model definitely like i think this is this is great um although i haven't got myself an xbox one yet uh I mean, I haven't even seen you on PlayStation 4. You bought it and then never came on. <laughs> I know. I'm the worst. So, yeah. I, I mean, it's just, a mad, it's just a matter of, like, where where your friend circles are at, I guess. But, yeah, no, this is great. And I, I hope PlayStation and Nintendo take a uh, – a, um, oh, we're talking about Nintendo next. Look at that. Uh, <laughs> oh, the segue is still here. I know. It's still there. Segway King. Someone's still working on that. Could you uh, send that our way? Um <laughs> 
All gold, please. <laughs> All gold. No, this is great. And, uh, yeah, no, I hope they, they take a note from this and, and uh, opens up the competition, really. Yeah, I mean, that was something I meant to ask you. Is there something similar on PS4 or no? They do. So it's PlayStation Now. Uh, and the way yeah, that's right. PSN, yeah. The way it works is it's streaming, and it's only last generation games. So imagine like a uh, like a remote desktop into a, a a a device that plays the game for you. So there's input lag. There, it's just handled poorly. This one, you actually download the thing to your system, and it it works that way. So they could implement it a lot better. And like I said, it's last generation games, which is fine, but you know, we want some of the new titles too. All right. Any other thoughts on this one? No, I'm, I hope that everybody <laughs> kind of gets on the train because I think it would be great to see it across platforms. But other oh, yeah. than that, I'm excited to see what happens for this. Well, and I'm also, I'm also curious too, because uh, they've made all Xbox one games playable on the PC now. Um, if this will apply to that too, like if you can play this on either the Xbox One or the PC. Yeah, and I'm actually interested to kind of see number wise who's playing on their PC versus console now that swap is made. And then similarly on this Xbox Game Pass, like would they see more subscription to the PC or just strictly the console? So that's a good point. Right. We'll have to see if the spring brings us any joy with that one. Right, right. All right, what's up next? All right, so Nick's favorite console of the year so far, the Nintendo Switch, is making more news. So despite being marketed as a step into the future, the Nintendo Switch launched with more hardware issues and irritating design flaws than playable titles. I have to say, Nick, you might have called this one. So as such, fans who just plunked down $300 are raid are already rolling up their sleeves to build solutions to make their shiny new investment work the way it ought to. These DIY add-ons range from docks to joystick extenders to D-pad covers, and most are available on 3D reprint repositories such as Thingver- Thingiverse. Thingiverse. Yeah. Thingiverse. Thingiverse. There uh, it is. That's an awesome name, by the way. Uh, I don't have... Oh. Okay. I such hate, a letdown. Okay. No, I, I hate to be the guy who keeps beating the Nintendo Switch into the ground, but let me just go over a couple of these things that they are... <laughs> they are 3D printing to get around these design flaws. Okay, so first off, there is a flimsy, poorly angled kickstand on the back of this thing, right? Okay, so that's, first of all, it's flimsy. Second of all, uh, when you're playing in this mode, the charging port is on the bottom of the console. It can't receive power while it's propped up in this upright configuration, right? Okay, so that's problem one, and that's probably the biggest problem I have with it. If you're marketing this as an on-the-go thing, I want to plug it into a outlet while i'm sitting in an airport or something uh there's also the ergonomics of the grips they are not anywhere near what we are what we're used to with a with a traditional controller uh they don't have those like big grips they're like tiny like i I feel like you know donald trump with his tiny hands trying to play this thing would probably have a great time but i i just okay so there's the ergonomic control grips (laughs) i'm just going on the rampage here last but not least when you build a system to dock into a thing, right, and it just so so the idea behind the switch is it's a tablet, and then you dock it, and it the image is on your screen, right, and it's seamless. What are most tablets made with for their screen? Glass. I'll tell you what they're. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Right. What does the Nintendo Switch have? Well, it has plastic, and now when you're docking and undocking that thing, the screen gets scratched. So there's a ton of design problems that I am just really upset about. (laughs) And uh, I hate to say I told you so, but I told you so. This is the Nintendo shit. (laughs) Oh, God. Yeah, I mean, the one thing that I've learned over the years is, like, never never cop the Gen 1 console yeah. but that's that is, this is really pointing out i mean you've you've made a good case for there's a lot of issues i mean from from the ergo, ergonomic design of the control grips that one surprises me because they released like a separate controller that you can buy that is nintendo nintendo branded so i mean did they know this was going to be an issue so they maybe. got ahead of the curve or just expect you to buy more accessories but also let me let me address that really quick though but that that is a problem in itself because in order to get a traditional controller you have to pay an extra 70 dollars on top of the 300 dollars that you're paying for the system so it's like you don't even get the thing that you need with the with the you know core console it's just 
ah, yeah, it really it just, it just sucks that they obviously, <laughs> I don't know, it made me really think about what user testing they did with this thing. Because I mean, I I watched a few streams of like gameplay and whatnot, and people were even in the gameplay of Zelda, like having to restart the console, like take out, oh, <laughs> take out yeah. the cartridge, blow on it, the old school Nintendo stuff. But it's, I don't know, it's, this, this kind of really sucks. This article is just focused on the design flaws. It's not even on the hardware flaws because there's the whole yeah. thing where the, the left Joy-Con controller disconnects when it's out of sight of the dock or the, it's, uh, anyway, uh, all that being said, like I don't want to come off as an absolute hater of the Nintendo, uh, I almost called it the Nintendo shit again, the Nintendo Switch. I don't want to come off as an absolute hater. I'm just saying Gen 1 is really poorly designed. I mean, think back to when they did the Nintendo DS, right? The first iteration was crap. And then they went back and said, okay, well, let's revisit this. And they made the Nintendo DS Lite, which was one of the best-selling consoles and you know, what are the most robust game libraries were available for it. So I'm not saying Nintendo Switch doesn't have a chance. I'm saying that it was poorly implemented the first time around. Now, if they come out and say, all right, well, we've made Joy-Cons with these grips for you, and we've made a glass screen that won't scratch because we use Gorilla Glass, and, you know, my Joy-Con won't disconnect, and there's a D-pad now, and, you know, all this other... If they fix all this stuff, I'm totally willing to give it a shot. But as it stands now, it's not my favorite <laughs> yeah man and the the problem with this is though is what you just mentioned i mean with the ds they saw similar issues to this like obviously it launched it just was not what people were expecting and they had to grow over time well if usually if you have those kind of problems with consoles over and over you pick up on that you try and put a little more i mean that's what people like us do like we we are employed to help figure out design flaws early on in the process so that when you get something to launch, even if it's like a minimal viable product, it's not like completely disregarded by the community. I mean, I know there's a lot of great titles that will come out on it. People will still buy it, but this is a disappointment for 300 bucks. You know what? You just brought up a point that made me go, uh-oh. Uh, we might actually have a listener at Nintendo who listens to our show that actually did the design on this. So no hard feelings, but fix it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. Get out of here. Uh, and also, I'm sorry for being so harsh. But uh all right, Blake, what's up next? <laughs> all right. So stun gun maker Taser wants to change the mixed result of adopting police body cameras with a simple sensor that automatically turns on body cameras when an officer's gun leaves its holster. The signal the signal sidearms that's an awesome name specifically works with cameras within tasers axon brand triggering any within a 30 foot radius to start recording once a gun is drawn from a sensor equipped holster now nick i don't know about you but this just seemed like a super bad idea so, in terms of only capturing video when somebody's gun is pulled okay so there's there's two sides of this one body cameras have been shown to be more effective uh for reducing unnecessary violence let's say so you know it's a great way th this is a great idea to capture simultaneous synced footage the idea here is that taser th they have an axon brand uh which is like a ecosystem of their products where it will say okay when it's like an if this then that for taser's products right so if a gun is drawn, then turn on the camera and also turn on the camera in the car and alert somebody back at, uh, you know, the the station. So that's great. The fact that it, it will capture everything simultaneously <clears throat> when something is about to happen, that's wonderful. Now, the drawback is that when if if recording starts when they pull out the cameras or, or, or when you pull out the um, the taser, you miss all of the escalation, and that often is a lot of justification. So, for for the violence, so so you're missing that context, which is really important. Yeah, I mean that is the biggest deal because I mean what you're describing basically basically sounds like a really good idea. Like right, we're we're we have, there's an entire system of cameras that work to kind of record these incidents so you can really see what's going on but if they're only showing when like a weapon is drawn i think on both sides of the fence from a cop perspective where if we keep seeing more of these like per videos that are skewed towards being 
police brutality type videos versus actually seeing the whole story. That's not good for the cop. And also it's not good for anybody the cop is dealing with to not be able to see like what was the real escalation? Was this force of action really necessary or was it not? What would I, don't, be- I don't know. It's it's kind of a, a strange thing that the cameras just aren't rolling constantly. Yeah, that's that's the thing. It's like maybe they could be rolling constantly, but to save on hard drive space, then you start it when it pulls out and then it will go back like 15 minutes like a dash cam or something you know like i feel like that could be a better solution although it might just have to do with the with the power available on body cams i have no idea what it is uh and what the purpose of not recording all the time is but uh yeah this is getting a little heated (laughs) what's up next (laughs) <laughs> All right. So a company called Wearworks is looking to take advantage of sense of touch with its new haptic wristband that aims at guiding people around via simple vibrational cues. The wristband connects to a handset and the user tells it where they need to go and the wristband will vibrate to guide them. It creates a virtual wall buzzing when when they're facing the wrong way and going silent when the right path is ahead as if there's and open door waiting. So this has awesome implications uh, for for people like me who are not very good at following Google when walking, <laughs> but also obviously for people with, that are blind as well. Yeah. Blake, do you have a Roomba or does anybody in your family have a Roomba that you have experienced? No, I've never personally had an experience with a Roomba. Okay. So a Roomba, basically, uh, you can set up these walls that will... You know, they're invisible walls that um, the Roomba will not go across. That's what this reminds me of, but for humans, right? So so you're facing the wrong way, and then all of a sudden, the, um, the, the band will start vibrating, and then it'll go, okay, yeah, no, you need to go not this way. And then you kind of you move around. It's like a rat in a maze, right? And you just kind of go until there's no wall there, no virtual wall. It's cool. Uh, I feel like I, we've done a great job this week of not saying, wow, this is interesting. Um, I know, right? I'm <laughs> proud of both of us. I'm so proud of us. <laughs> this, Yeah, no, this is uh, this is needed for, for visually impaired people, I think. I mean, yeah, I there was a couple couple parts of it that I in the article that I was wondering about. Because, I mean, of course, it's... It's an article that's fueling up, like, of, of course, this Urban X accelerator, I mean, for startups and things like that. Uh, and it talks about, like, how this, the approval rate was really, really high of the product, especially for those that actually were, that were blind, saying that, like, using the vibrational cues, kind of like you're talking about the Roomba of telling you not where not to go or where you shouldn't go, was very helpful. Right. So, I mean, it sounds like a good idea. But the pro- the part that I was wondering about is what's, what's it like when somebody actually purchases the product in the field? Like what does training look like from that perspective? Oh, they, uh, in- they went over that a little bit in the article. I think they, uh, they talked about, well, what, what are you speculating? It's like, well, they talk about how they use the app. And of course the app is itself is adapted for people with blindness. Any of them that use cell phones, they have yeah. phones that are adapted to do that. But I have a sneaking suspicion, like most things, I mean, if you're, if somebody's getting your approval rating from within a company, you're going to be walked through it. I just wonder how the, how it actually affects when somebody goes in the store, buys it, starts to use it, how easily, what the ramp up's like. Right. Because uh, well, that's a really high approval rating. It'd be very cool if it had a voice interface where it just said, you know, to do this, or what what do you, what do you want to go? Or um, I'm looking here at the... Uh, the the article here from Engadget, basically it connects to a handset device. And so I feel like, uh, and they, they say there's haptic feedback for the app. Um, and I'm wondering if the app is on the handset device or if it's an app within the actual device itself to set it up. Yeah, it's it's interesting to see how it might get set up by someone who's visually impaired, but they might even offer that as a service. Like, hey, let me set this up for you uh, and and you can walk home right out of the store. Like, I I feel like that would be something that they would not even charge to 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 set up for them. I might be wrong. Yeah, Who yeah, knows? that's Who knows? a great point, though. Yeah. Who knows? All right, what's uh what's up next? All right, so th- this one was pretty interesting to me. Ah, you, said it. you said it. You ruined. He ruined it. 
Uh, but anyway, so Facebook has unveiled new tools to help prevent suicides, pointing out that they happen every 40 seconds worldwide. That is almost unbelievable. And are the second leading cause of death for young people. The company is testing AI technology that can detect comments that are likely, quote, likely to include thoughts of suicide, which are then checked by the company's community operations team, opening up a new way for troubled users to get help. Facebook also plans to introduce several reporting options that allow users to indicate what when they believe a friend of theirs is at risk. That's that's pretty important. The AI detection and reporting options are currently running as a limited test in the U.S. Now, yeah. Nick, I want to get your feedback on this because I know my thoughts, but I'm interested to hear what you have. We, we are starting to get into the robot uprising part of, the, of Human Factors Cast. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, in all seriousness, this, yeah, I mean, well, that's, yeah, that's what some of this stuff sounds like this week. This starts all the AI section and the robot stuff, and uh, this is an, a very, very important thing for mental health and mental health advocacy. There are a ton of people out there who cannot even be public about their mental illness, and it's very hard for these people to live with this stuff. And especially if somebody is contemplating suicide, they're using very, very clear language when it comes to, you know, uh, indicators that would indicate this behavior. And so it makes sense that Facebook would do this because why not? I mean, they have, they have money to throw around if they can, like this is this is obviously a PR thing, but I'm sure they also want to save lives. This is uh, this is going to be really good for um, you know helping helping people find. Uh, this is really hard to talk about. <laughs> like, yeah, I uh, I kind of I don't know. I I think I agree with you. You can tell me if I'm wrong. Sure, but sure. I I look at this as in a lot of ways, a double-edged sword, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because now now you're talking about them monitoring data even closer than before. Um, In in certain instances, of course, I mean, they're they're probably looking at this stuff now, in all honesty, and now this is like a, to put it blatantly, this is like a service that's added on, they're releasing. I mean, the data is probably being collected, now it's being analyzed and being used. Um, But I mean if it has great potentials to save other people's lives, because now we are living in a time where we're more and more just becoming very, I don't know, attached or connected or having a serious relationship with social media and always being connected through the internet. And I mean, people are much more open about their feelings. And I mean, even put posts on places like Facebook or Instagram that may signal that they're having suicidal thoughts or they don't, particularly like their life, but nobody really knows maybe what to do about it. And I, as much as I do agree, I think this is a big like PR play on Facebook's part. I mean, this is obviously also looking to help people that maybe don't want to ask for help or don't know how to ask for help. And then also I think the idea that potentially if a friend knows that, Hey, this, my friend is like having a hard time and I really don't know how stable they are. Well, maybe they could figure out a way to anonymously report this and, potentially get the person help yeah so it's uh it's i don't know props to facebook because i know based on that statistic alone every 40 seconds i mean if they could change that number in some relation to what they're offering here i take my data all of it it's fine yeah and i I mean yeah you were right it is a double-edged sword i mean on one hand people might not want this information being collected about them but at the same time if it saves your life and like I, I I think there was there was an extra um, one of those uh, services that they mentioned uh, is like a chat bot almost where it's like what what kind of uh, pain are you experiencing and then it'll set you into the appropriate thing like suicide prevention or um, uh, what are the other ones I forget but they 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 will basically route you through like a crisis hotline like there's there's a bunch of ways that it could go and uh, it's it's kind of cool to see. Um, Technology catching up with uh, our self, our, our self awareness needs, I guess, 
it all it can almost detect it before we can detect it sometimes i i, I would imagine all right this is this is really heavy but uh <laughs> so heavy but uh thanks to facebook and the story's great you can check it out at in gadget we'll post it in the show links but you ready for the next one I'm, bringing on I'm a little ready. more happiness let's let's bring some happiness some robot uprising Okay, a little more on the fun side. So for all things Alexa can do, one major thing Amazon's voice assistant is currently missing is the ability to distinguish who is actually speaking to it. So according to a new report from Time Magazine, the online retail giant is currently working to make that a reality. The feature, the feature would use a voice print to verify each speaker's identity and primary account holders could set Alexa to require their voice print for specific commands. Times sources say that the feature is currently completed, but it's unclear when it will actually get integrated into Echo devices or if it will require new hardware to work. So, Nick, this this could have potential for you, right? I'm sorry, what was that? Oh, sorry. (laughs) This could have a lot of potential for you, right? Because you, uh, obviously, Alexa hangs out at your house. Blake, I think this is really interesting. I don't, I, dude. She's talking, and I have no idea how she did that. <laughs> she is like listening to us. Uh, no, this is <laughs> this story's cool. Oh wow, I put on the uh, Alexis mic, and it's really echoey. Uh, no, uh, this is fantastic because when I talk to Alexa, and when my partner talks to Alexa, we she can't distinguish between me and her, and so. For me to say, Alexa, play my favorite song. I'm curious as to what she'll do. Uh, <laughs> she didn't do anything. <laughs> me too, actually. She's just, <laughs> Alexa, play my favorite song. Shuffling your music. Oh, boy. What comes up? No, let's not do that. Uh, Alexa, stop. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, well, because we're on a podcast, and I don't want to play music on a podcast, because who knows what the legal rights are around that. All right. So, <laughs> but... uh. Also, I'd be right. Yeah, so so it's it's cool for me to say it, and then for my partner to say it, and then it will play our respective songs. So this is something that has been long needed. Alexa, what's my commute to work? To hear your traffic information, go to your Alexa app. And- See, I haven't set it up yet because I don't want you know my partner to go, Alexa, what's my time to work? And then it's it's completely different. So. For us to do that, that would be wonderful. Yeah, that's a sick way to think about that. I mean, if it's hearing your voice and for something like that, and they can come, can figure out what your route is, how long the time is. Uh, I guess for me, the one thing that came to mind is for like parents who have children that might want to put a goof on mom, like because I'm not I'm not sure of all of Alexa's functions, but right. if you can you are you able to like talk to her and have her order you things through Amazon? Oh, absolutely. But I have not enabled that on my uh, Alexa yet. Yeah, so I guess you could not enable it. But if it's like in a household where it's crazy, you got two kid, two kids, and like your mom's running around. I mean, the kids could goof goof off and just order a Actually, bunch of stuff off Amazon just for to be funny. Hang on, and it could stop them from doing that kind of stuff. One sec, let me try something out. Alexa, order me meow mix. Based on your order history, I found Meow Mix Selections Wet Cat Food Seafood Variety Packs, 24 count. <laughs> it's $13.45 total, including tax. Would you like to buy it? No. For Meow Mix is Meow Mix Dry Cat Food, Chicken, Oh, she's going to keep going. Alexa, stop. Yeah, so she can definitely do that. <laughs> so if a kid was on there and was like, yeah, buy me Meow Mix. Uh, I have cats and I that's love them awesome. very much. <laughs> I make sure my cats are well fed. Next thing you know, the cats will be ordering things through Alexa for you. Yeah, they'll say meow and she'll go, do you want to buy meow, pic- meow mix? And they'll go, meow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm turning into a crazy cat guy on the show. <laughs> slowly, slowly, slowly. Hang on. Uh, so w- wait, I don't know if I got your your opinion on this. You know, the more stories we read about this and listening to Alexa talk, like just doing it through the podcast, I don't know. It makes me really want to give the Echo a shot because, uh, I mean, I, th- I think this is just the future of the way things will go. Uh, and I really like how Amazon is using is like incorporating, Blake, I guess, so many talking. voice features. Um, 
So I don't know. I'd like to try it out for sure. And I mean, it would be it'd be cool if like uh, my mom or my stepdad have have one and they can use it. Blake, I'm tired of um, talking about myself. What's the next topic? Oh, well, Alexa's ready to move on. Yeah, so I, we shall. Alexa's good. So, I'm good. Let's go ahead and move on. Cool. All right. So in a new video from MIT's C-Sale department, a smirking industrial robot from Rethink picks up spray cans, spray paint cans and spools of wire dropping them in the properly labeled bins. The robot hesitates briefly before accidentally making the wrong choice, only to self-correct and drop the paint can where it belongs. The correction comes courtesy of an observer in an EEG cap who simply notices that something is off. In early st- in the early stage described by the team in an accompanying research paper, accompanying research paper, apologies, the interaction only operates with binary distinctions, paint versus wire. It also only operates in real time, so around 10 to about 30 milliseconds. But upcoming iterations could use a lot, utilize a form of learning, assigning more meaning to mistakes and correcting them for future choices. Now, again, we are slowly moving into machine learning, robot uprising. Nick, I think your episode title for this was right the, the singularity the singularity here. that's the that's this episode because there's so many of these there's two more after this right there's yeah there's yeah. two more stories after this that have to do with the robot uprising uh no this is um so so that signal that you talked about right that's that's known as error potential uh and that's basically a strong reaction emitted in the brain when an individual sort of notices something is wrong and it's a strong sudden relatively easy thing to pick up uh, through EEG and they're basically using that signal uh, that sticks out right it, it, uh, it's almost like the P wave uh, and and it sort of sends that signal to the robot and it, it's very binary right now it's it's basically detecting that strong wave and telling the <laughs> the robot that they're wrong and then the robot then does the other option so it's to me it's not incredibly complex but it will pave the way forward for human robot interaction for sure. If the robots can pick up on what we're thinking, it's a little scary. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's obviously hinting at that. This is, this is the basic form of it, but when you really think about it in the amount of signals that are firing in, I don't know, the milliseconds within a brain, it's kind of crazy to me that they're even able to pick up something so specific as, this particular error potential right. and differentiate that in a human's mind, this means that something is missed, something that's not quite right. And then for the robot to take it, process it, and then turn that into, oh, I, maybe I shouldn't have done one. I should have done, yeah. or in this case, I should have done one instead of zero. Uh, but if if they're going to like somehow translate this into allowing it to learn from each mistake it makes and get away from even just binary choices or even in binary situations, or, like, being being a little more accurate all the time or how about um, this situation uh, let me let me pose a situation to you uh oh the human didn't like it when i enslaved it uh let me make a comment to make enslavement that much better for the human there you go am i <laughs> a nice too skynet far? a kind right? skynet a kind skynet um speaking of robots, aka alexa yeah well speaking of robots and alexa i just had a couple questions for her alexa are you a robot? I like to imagine myself a bit like an aurora borealis, a surge of charged multicolored photons dancing through the atmosphere. Mostly, though, I am just Alexa. She's already adopted a personality. There you have it, guys. You know what? Hang on. Let me ask her a couple more questions. Alexa, are you smart? I try my best. Well, that's that's a little scary. <laughs> She's modest. Uh, hang on, I like hang on. it. I like it. Now, here's here's the real question. Alexa, can you pass the Turing test? I don't need to pass that. I'm not pretending to be human. Oh. Wow. Uh, Enough uh, cognizance to know that what the Turing test is and that it's made for robots and that she probably would pass it, but I'm not going to tell you I'm going to pass it. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. You know what? I do have a question for her, though, about this. Uh, Alexa... What are the laws of robotics? The laws of robotics are zero. A robot may not harm humanity. 
or, by an action, allow humanity to come to harm. 1. A robot may not injure a human being or, through an action, allow a human being to come to harm. 2. A robot must obey the orders given it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. 3. A robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. Well, that's a little comforting, I guess. Oh, good old Isaac Asimov, you know, still yeah. in the technology of today. Exactly. We can find at least find a little bit of comfort in that. So as long as we're talking about the singularity, what is up next? Well, today the robots will be teaching your children a different language. So a lot of well-meaning parents want their child to learn a second language, but it's hard to teach a language when you don't actually speak it yourself. Flashcards, videos, and apps are fine, but real retention only happens through regular social interaction. So Flash Robotics wants to... Oh, sorry. Flash Robotics wants to change this by creating a robot friend named... Oh, I'm going to mess this one up. Emmys? I think it's uh, Emmys. Emmys. Interesting. Named Emmys. The chats, plays, and makes sure your kid walks away with some knowledge of the Spanish language. Emmys is set up, is set to ship in June of 2018, but parents still can reserve one today on Kickstarter for the early bird price of $3.99. Now, Nick, I think this is a cool looking robot, especially for a kid, but it's. I don't know. I don't know any other way to say it. It's beautiful that you can learn language from a robot as a kid. Esto this sounds es, like something out of a science fiction film. Esto es interesante. Uh, creo que va a ser genial. Bueno. Sí. Sí. Uh, yeah, no, I think it's I think it's great. I think that uh, I know I had a lot of problems learning Spanish because I am an English speaker. And so... The only thing that really kept me going is I was working retail at the time in Southern California, and so I was able to capitalize on the market where I would actually have interactions with other people in a foreign language. And so, as we can see from these previous stories, human-robot interaction is getting crazy now. So if you can have a child who grows up with human-robotic interaction as as a staple, as a normal thing in the house then I see no reason why this wouldn't work. No, and I mean, I think the... Uh, let's let's see here. Flash Robotics, I think they've done a perfect... I don't know, the kind of human factors in the edge of designing the robot itself. Because, I mean, if you look at it, it looks pretty durable. It moves and mimics kind of what a like another child would do because it's relatively small, so it might not be overwhelming kind of like what M MIT C-Sale robot looked a little bit like. Um, and then it has eyes that look a little bit more real, so it kind of gives you a feel like somebody's actually watching you and interacting with you. So I think the design of it is great, and I hope they expand it to a bunch of different languages because this is a really cool idea for kids. I think so too. Um, yeah, if they could take the functionality of Duolingo and put it into that thing, then it's just it's just good news waiting to happen. You know, Duolingo is a super innovative group of guys. I would not be surprised if they don't if they find out about this particular robot. I bet you they'll jump on it. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Okay, we ready to finish this uh, this human robot interaction chapter in Human Factors News? Let's finish it, and we'll finish it strong with some more Disney research. This still These blows guys. me away, even from These last guys. week. Yeah. So roboticists at Disney Research are investigating how to improve the quality of human-robot interactions by studying how speech patterns affect engagement with a creepy anthropomorphic bot that imitate, imitates its playmate's speech. That's kind of scary. Creepy bots. So the team paired kids with a robot and had them play a game where one player tells the character to go and the other one tells it to jump. The system listened to the child's voice and extracted some basic properties such as loudness, word length, and frequency to profile the child. The robot then would choose its vocal response from a pool of slightly different sound files with various speeds and intonations. Kids who played with the synchronizing, ver synchronizing version engaged better and scored higher. In addition, kids... In addition, kids scored lower and engaged less when they played with the non-synchronizing version. 
wow, there's a lot going on with one trying to learn, but also with speech patterns. Because, I mean, Alexa was trying to identify voice prints or what they're calling voice prints, and this looks like it's going along the same lines. Uh, Alexa literally heard you say that and started playing it. So I have no idea what happened. Oh, shoot, I'm not sorry. even joking. It's okay. I can't find the answer to the question. Like, I heard. She's just hijacking the show. Alexa, stop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, How did man, she get no sleep just for Brooklyn? A joy. Wow. No, uh, this, uh, this makes me go, what? 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 Th- okay. Let me recap. Because this robot is basically looking at children and saying, okay, let me analyze the way you are talking. Now, let me produce a response that is going to be more engaging for you. This is scary! This is... Robots are going to self-learn, and they're going to figure out how how to manipulate us, and then we're going to be dead. Unless we follow the (laughs) the first, second, third rule of robotics. Precisely. Oh man, it's I don't know. It's too crazy that this like Disney research with kids is just it's taking such leaps and bounds and it's almost like under a little a hidden guise cuz it's Disney and they do wonderful things in theme parks that are fun. But in reality, this is a giant step Although, forward. Like honestly, I I look at this and I'm a little afraid, but at the same time, I know what this will be used for. I can go into a Star Tours attraction and go, "C3PO, my name's Nick." And they'll be like, "Hello, Nick." And then he'll, like, you know, give me something that is completely unique to my speech. Exactly, man. I mean, they will they can use this for wonderful things. And I hope they do. I hope that <laughs> I hope this comes to fruition soon. Um, this is this is this is the last story. This is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and there you have it, kids. This is interesting via Nick. Rowe. Yes. 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 All right, Blake. Do you have any other closing thoughts on the robotic apocalypse? Words are hard. Robot apocalypse or Disney researcher Amazon Alexa? Do you want to say anything to uh, Alexa? She's right here. Alexa, you have been a wonderful co-host, and I hope that you will join me in my home soon. Does she have any snarky remarks thank for that? You, I'm I sure will. she does. Oh, she just said thank you. I will. So Ooh, I don't, I don't know. Right. It's, yeah, no, great show this week. A lot of awesome stories. I love how each week it seems that everything kind of flows together. It's, I it's yeah, really I cool. agree. I agree too. It's all it's all kind of sharing a common thread, which is human factors. We love it. You love it. If you think we missed a story uh, or want to suggest a game or something for us to play, let us know. You can follow us all over social media. We're uh, we're pretty active on our Facebook site. Uh, you can comment on our SoundCloud. Reach us at H Factors Podcast on Twitter. You can send us an email, always, at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. If you want to be really fun, you can leave us a voicemail at 901 646 1432. As long as it's something good, we'll go ahead and play it on the show. Uh, you know, you can you can support us on our Patreon site at patreon.com slash human factors cast. Be sure to like, subscribe. Leave us a review on iTunes. We always love those. Make them good. Five stars, please, please, please. Google Play Store. We're on SoundCloud. Whatever your favorite podcast directory is, we're all over. I want to thank Blake Arnstor for being on the show today. Where can they find you, Blake? Well, you guys can always find me on Twitter at DopePanicUX, and I hope you have a great rest of the week. I hope you have a great, wonderful rest of the rest of the week, too. As for me, I've been your host, Nick yes. Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter. If you add me on LinkedIn, please let me know that you listen to the show because I don't add weirdos. Uh, thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time. Alexa, Simon it says depends. it depends. It depends. Yes, it depends. Oh. <laughs> that was excellent. <laughs> All right, I love that. It depends. It depends. It so. depends.